I want to welcome you all uh, to the Visiting Scholar Phi Beta Kappa Lecture. Uh, it's a great treat for a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa, and we've worked hard to earn it, uh, to have a national Phi Beta Kappa visiting scholar come and speak before us. Um, I'll introduce Dr. Chocksky in a moment, but um, he's on campus for two days. Uh, he's spent some time with our honor students uh, early this afternoon. Uh, and he will be um, talking to a variety of other people, to a, a class on, on religion and philosophy, and, and perhaps to some sociology students before uh, he leaves us on Friday afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know, Phi Beta Kappa is the United States' oldest and most distinguished honors, academic honors society. It was founded in 1776. I won't go as far as saying that it was the most important event that happened in 1776, but <laughs> it, it did happen in that year after July 4th, so Phi Beta Kappa isn't older than the United States. But um, it was founded by a group of students at William and Mary University, which is the uh, mother chapter. It thereafter spread throughout the United States uh, it can claim membership of some of the most distinguished people in the country's history, not merely uh, men and women of letters and scientists, um, but also uh, statesmen um, uh, like, uh, I believe, James Madison and John Quincy Adams uh, and any number of American presidents. So it may come, if you're an undergraduate student here, uh, in your senior year usually, uh, that you will be invited to join. Um, that will happen uh, if you have achieved a very high level of distinction as measured by grade point, but also, uh, and you might want to keep this in mind if you're still kind of organizing your program of study uh, and would like to eventually claim this distinction, breadth of learning, breadth of interest. Uh, we want to see people who um, think that the love of learning is an important part of their lives. So to our speaker, uh, Dr. Jamshid Chaksi is Distinguished Professor and Chairperson of the Department of Central Eurasian Studies, a vast swatch of territory uh, that actually runs, uh, he tells me, from Finland in the west to Mongolia in the east. So that's a pretty big remit for, uh, for a scholar. Um, he is an authority on a great many things, on the history of Iran, on the uh, Arab conquest of, uh, of Iran and Central Asia, uh, on Zoroastrianism, uh, and on uh, the contemporary political scene in Iran, uh, and the various currents and particularly the position of uh, ethnic and religious minorities in contemporary Iran. He is the author of any number of books, and they range uh, in their interests, uh, Evil, Good, and Gender, Facets of the Feminine in Zoroastrian Religion, in Zoroastrian Religious History. Uh, that was back in 2002. Conflict and Cooperation, Zoroastrian Subalterns, and Muslim Elites in Medieval Iranian Society. And he is also Associate Editor of the, of the uh, Encyclopedia of Sex and Gender. So there are all kinds of interesting questions you can throw at him when, uh, when uh, he is done speaking. He is also uh, a member of the Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And he's served on that council for, I guess, what, eight, nine years at this point. That's a presidential nomination. Uh, Senate confirmation as well. So um, he is actually the honorable uh, Dr. Jamshid Chaksi. 
Yes, if you're confirmed by the Senate. You wouldn't think that confirmation by the Senate nowadays would make you honorable. Uh, looking at what's happening, it would kind of make you the reverse. But, but that's not true for, for our guest. So. For the rest of the I did do a full background check. <laughs> Prior to my 18th birthday. So, and we, we, and we, and we, we had the FBI look at him thoroughly before we invited him here. So let me give you Dr. Chalk. So let me begin by thanking uh, the Lambda chapter here for inviting me. Uh, thanks to Steve as well and uh, uh, to the Dean who I had the great pleasure of meeting earlier today and to the students who came to the luncheon, those of you who are here this evening and then those who will be with me tomorrow as well. So great thanks for coming today, spending the evening here. Uh, so. Iran is in the news a lot. A lot of understandings, misunderstandings, a lot of history. Uh, and what I thought of doing today was sort of give you a little brief sketch show about 45 minutes or so of uh, sort of Iran's recent history, 20th, 21st century. So uh, at the end of it, I hope you'll have a better sense of why, why we are at the situation we are in currently, uh, in terms of an Islamic Republic, in terms of contentious relations with the United States, in terms of nuclear weapons, to just sort of give you a, a broader idea of how things came about. And uh, what I'm also trying to do, uh, I'll show you a, a lot of images, uh, sort of uh, both as background to what I'm talking about, but also hopefully so that you can uh, localize an image with what I'm saying at a particular point. Okay. Now, so let's just start in terms of geography because geography often determines a lot of things. And what you, what you can see here, the Islamic Republic of Iran or Iran in general, uh, the modern borders laid down essentially in the 16th, 17th century. So you have, you have Pakistan right down the corner, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, the Caspian Sea, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Iraq, uh, the Persian Gulf around it. Keep in mind that for uh, most of, uh, that, keep in mind that Iraq is essentially a, a recent ent a political entity uh, um, you know, created by the British. Uh, what, what is now Iraq for much of its history after, after about 550 BCE was part of Iran. And then uh, parts were lost to the Ottoman Empire, uh, and then of course Iraq was carved out at the same time that places like Jordan were carved out uh, by the British. Uh, so, but in terms of, of the country, what I really think you should keep in mind is, you know, think uh, it, it, it's a little larger than, than Alaska. So about uh, 650,000 square miles or so. Uh, several small islands in the Persian Gulf are also held by Iran. And just FYI, Iran took over those islands uh, under the last Shah with the full blessing of the United States. So just to you know, give you a little setting of, you know, of how this stuff goes back and forth. But a lot of Iran is determined by geography in the sense of, of its location with the Persian Gulf. So that means maritime trade from early antiquity. The Persian Gulf uh, down uh, the coast of Africa, uh, up, the Horn, uh, up the Horn of Africa, through the Red Sea, uh, the Indian Ocean. Uh, maritime trade connecting all the way to China. Uh, again, going back to at least a couple of centuries before the time of, of, of Jesus. Okay? Uh, geography uh, determines, as you can see, the, the red lines on the map uh, are the main ro road and railway lines, uh, red and black there. And that's partly because there are two major mountain ranges, one over here, the Zagros, one up here, the Albors. And so what happens is, in terms of rainfall, rainfall drains into the Caspian and drains down into Iraq. As a result, uh, Iran, the, the plateau itself, maybe gets uh, about 16 inches of rain a year. Uh, in the north, up in the north, you can have up to 90 inches. Down here, maybe two inches a year. So extremes in terms of precipitation, extremes in terms of temperature, winter up, uh, in, in the Caucasus areas can hit minus 40. 
summers down uh, over here uh, can go to 140. And uh, down here, sand flies. So US troops would wear uh, free collars uh, on their shins. Uh, works on dogs, works on, uh, for troops. In terms of, of not getting bitten because that really hurts. Okay? But that should sort of give you an idea of the area. Now, the other thing we think about Iran is oil and natural gas. Okay? Uh, so Iran has uh, approximately the fifth largest proven reserves of, of crude oil and the second largest in natural gas. Uh, in fact, what you should keep in mind is the US now is the largest, has the largest proven reserves of, uh, of oil. Uh, Russia has the largest proven reserves of natural gas. Uh, now, modern oil, uh, and, and, and oil seeps from Iran were used in antiquity. So we know there was a trade in uh, bitumen, asphalt. Asphalt trade uh, uh, that ran down the Indian Ocean. Uh, we have asphalt that uh, the chemical nature of, of petrochemicals is that you can tag from where they come. So we know that uh, petroleum seeps around here uh, were serving asphalt supplies to places like Thailand, etc. Uh, uh, even in the second, third century of the Common Era, uh, bitumen being transported in uh, large vessels. Uh, but modern, modern oil. Okay, modern oil. Uh, is found in southwestern Iran. The year was 1908. Uh, this uh, discovery of, of uh, crude oil in the modern Middle East, 1908, was under a concession that had been granted by Iran, uh, by the Qajar regime of Iran, the Qajar dynasty, to this British company. And I expect that most of you at some point in your life have or will pump gasoline at a petrol at a station uh, uh, owned by the company. Any guesses as to the current name? British BP. Yeah, BP. There you go. Okay. So BP, and so what happens is BP uh, 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 starts uh, pumping the crude. The next step is that the British Navy moves from coal to oil. So that's when petrochemicals really burst out onto the scene. Okay. That's because then we're looking at massive uh, trade being possible. Now, however, just before this oil, so this discovery was 1908, modern uh, oil uh, in the Middle East, in Iran. A year before that, 1907, we have what's called the Anglo-Russian Treaty. The Anglo-Russian Treaty of 1907 divided Iran into spheres of influence between Russia and Britain. The Russians got the north, uh, the, the British got the Syria. So contiguous with British India. Do you think the Iranians were consulted on this Anglo-Russian? No, okay. So let's talk about contentious relationships and how they develop. Okay, the Iranians weren't, con so the British and the Russians decide this is going to be the way they're going to, they're divvying up the world, this is how we'll divvy up Iran. And then a year later, uh, the British uh, locate oil in the southwest. And so, okay. The Anglo Russian Treaty was just one example of uh, the British, both uh, uh, in, the, in the, this part of the Middle East and for British India, so sort of encroaching on Iran. Iran would never be formally colonized, let's say, like British India, uh, you know, uh, but Iran for substantial parts of the 20th century would be de facto controlled by various uh, colonial and superpowers. And that sort of sets the stage for a lot of the, of the rea Iranian reaction against the West. Uh, one, one thing that did happen as a result of this uh, Anglo-Russian treaty is that uh, during the First World War, Iranian nationalists support Germany. Okay. So the First World War breaks out, uh, Iranian nationalists are supporting Germany, Germany uh, is providing Irania, Iran with heavy machinery. The, the reaction is that uh, as Iran works with Germany, Ru uh, uh, Russian troops move into Iran from the north and the British come in from the southeast. Okay, uh, and so uh, and and so now you have physical presence of foreign troops in Iran. Uh, 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 
uh, uh, and uh, as the, as the uh, administrative of, uh, structure of Iran becomes dysfunctional with the presence of these uh, uh, f uh, foreign, um, the, the foreign military presence, what we begin to see is that there is widespread famine. 18, uh, 19, uh, 18, 19, 19, widespread famine across Iran that adds to this dissatisfaction against the colonial powers. Uh, by 1921, much of southern Iran is held by the British and much of northern Iran is held by the Bolsheviks. So, uh, uh, you know, so I want you to sort of start seeing this context, okay? And let me catch up in, in terms of images here. To just, you know, give you a, a sense of this is the Zagros Mountains, uh, uh, Iranian Kurdistan. Uh, this is the Zagros as you are, on the other side is Iraq. So you can see all the drainage ending up on that side. Uh, uh, northern Iran, uh, the Albos range, uh, Again, drainage into the Caspian on that side and, and essentially snow melt. Uh, so Tehran is off over here, okay? The central, uh, central deserts of Iran. This is out uh, on the eastern border with uh, Afghanistan where you have river, more rivers and therefore more grain cultivation. Central Iran, again, where there are rivers, this is uh, Isfahan. Uh, the terrain changes right away. So water is very essential in terms of being able to do anything there. And gas, of course. So, come to the sky. So, as the British and the Russians are competing for Iran, and for the British, Iran is the buffer to keep the Russians out of British India, okay? And that adds also to additional tensions because from the Iranian perspective, uh, uh, you know, insult to injury is that uh, uh, they see themselves as merely, you know, okay, the British want us, they want us ultimately only as a buffer, uh, uh, you know, uh, for, to protect the jewel in the crown. So, uh, the, so those are the sentiments all building up. Uh, and uh, as the Qajar dynasty attempts to push the British and the Russians back, in fact, the, the, the Qajar dynasty uh, reaches a deal with the Russians uh, whereby uh, the Russians would forgive Iranian debt, agree to leave Iran, uh, but, but, Iranian, uh, but the Qajar regime has to agree that no other foreign power will be allowed to be in Iran. So the British, it just not, this did not sit well with the British. So the British supported a military coup by this guy, an Iranian colonel who had actually be, had been trained uh, in the Cossack Brigade. So you can sort of see how alliances also shift in this process. Uh, Reza Shah, uh, he, uh, he takes over, as, uh, becomes prime minister. Um, uh, then 1926, he, has, he sets up a parliament, a majlis, that declares him the new Shah. So we end up with the Pahlavi dynasty. But again, what we want you to see that this is an individual coming to power largely with foreign support, as opposed to having an indigenous space, okay? Now, where's the Shah? Reza Shah is, was attempting to use education and uh, judicial reforms to reduce the influence of the uh, Shiite religious clergy and institutions and to create a modern secular state. So the interesting thing is Reza Shah combined aristocratic ideas with Western notions of modernization, but also very much influenced by Marxist socialist, socialist no, notions of a nation state of, of workers collectively, uh, you know, carrying the nation forward. Uh, but again, you know, what happened was it was a top-down effort. So uh, he he passed what was called the Uniform Dress Law. Okay, and that, that's the, the direct English translation, uh, uniform uh, uh, address law, uh, essentially abolishing the use of indigenous clothing by men and women to be replaced by Western style clothing. Would that have been something that followed the Turkish? Uh, and, and, and that was going to be my next thing. In other words, Reza Shah ends up uh, also in a competition with what's happening in Turkey, with Ataturk, with the two of them, again, same sort of models, uh, attempting to one-up each other also in terms of how fast they could have progress. 
So you have those factors going on as well. Now, part of the change, of course, means that women no longer had to wear traditional dress, the veil, and all the rest. Women were encouraged to seek education, meaning secular education, uh, to enter the workforce. Uh, civil marriage was established. The law of divorce was modified to grant women legal standing and rights akin to those of Western countries at that time. Okay, so we are talking about the 1920s here. Uh, so uh, essentially, you know, the West serving the model. Now, while of course Re Reza Shah had been brought to power by the British, while uh, he was emulating, you know, Western technology and all the rest, he was also by his, from his own background, his own experience, he was deeply suspicious of the British, the Russians, and the rest. So when the Second World War breaks out, Iran declares that it's neutral. That's OK for some time. But then in June 1941, Nazi Germany attacks the Soviet Union. There, then Iran once again says, we are politically uh, neutral in the war. That does not sit well with the Allies, because the Nazis are moving into the Soviet Union, and uh, the Western powers need to be able to supply the Soviets with equipment. They have the equipment in the Persian Gulf. They have the equipment in British India. Iran is not willing to cooperate. Soviet forces invade Iran from the northwest. The British army enters via Iraq and via the coast of the Persian Gulf. Reza Shah is forced to abdicate. His son is placed on the throne. And that brings the very first US military presence in the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf Command lands. It is tasked with moving the equipment, both via road and rail lines from the United States and from British India to help the Soviets push the Nazis back. And hundreds of thousands of tons of equipment are shipped that way. And like I said, the, the, uh, the coordination is, was by the US Central, uh, the Persian Gulf Command. Now, So, 1941, the uh, Allies have moved in to Iran again. Here we go. 1943, Tehran. The shaping of the global order we now have. The order from which I will say the United States has been the very greatest beneficiary. Okay. So we now rush to Pull away from the world, we may want to keep in mind that we created that order. As you can see, the participants, you don't see the Iranian monarch anywhere on the scene. Okay? This, is the, this is the world that was coming, and you can see who the central figure is. Okay? Yeah. FDR is there, and that, this is the beginning of the rise of the United States to be ultimately the one remaining superpower. And so, yeah, and so Iran is there at the center of all this, and yet at the periphery you know, used but not directly involved. Okay. So this is when the new world order is getting laid out. The world war, Second World War ends. Mid to late 1940s, British, American, and uh, Soviet companies are exporting oil from Iran, paying, Iranian, uh, paying the Iranian government only a nominal royalty. It would cost more to pump a barrel from the ground than the Iranians received, by many measures. And that set the stage for the next confrontation, this guy. Mohammad Mossadegh, PhD as an economist from the Sabon, a descendant of the previous Qajar dynasty as well. He rises within the uh, parliamentary system, eventually becomes prime minister. <coughs> Overriding the uh, Shah with the support of the parliament, Iran nationalizes its oil industry. 
And then Mossadegh goes one step further. The economists in Tehran calculate the value of oil pumped out previously, and they send bills. The one that lands in London is, was pretty much like a bomb going off. And uh, uh, the net result, of course, is that the British propose a settlement that Washington backs, and Mossadegh essentially shreds, uh, saying full compensation is needed. The Shah, of course, siding with the West, is willing to compromise. The na Iranian nationalists essentially sideline the Shah. That brings us to August 1953. The United States advises the Shah to leave Iran. He flies off to Rome. The British and the US have already set the stage for the counter coup. A couple of days later, the Shah is back in power. Uh, this was uh, known as Operation Ajax. Uh, largely, the groundwork had been laid by uh, British intelligence services, uh, but the CIA was involved. And very interestingly, the person who led the CIA portion of the, of the operation was Kermit Roosevelt Jr., uh, grandson of Teddy, a cousin of FDRs. Okay? Uh, and Kermit actually published his account a couple of months after uh, the 1979 Iranian Revolution. You should go read it. It's called Counter Coup. And it lays out, uh, uh, the, you know, the, so the Shahs brought back, the, uh, back, back to power. Uh, by 1961, he's firmly in place. Campaigns to I mean, eliminate uh, illiteracy are launched. This is the modern public library in Isfahan. Interestingly, in, sen in the sense of, you know, Iran being sort of uh, particularly after 1979, sort of in some ways trapped in time, Iranian libraries use the Dewey Decimal System for cataloging, not the Library of Congress system. Okay? Uh, the uh, Iranian librarians are frankly no different from American librarians. Freedom of information, access, all the rest. Okay? So campaigns to get rid of illiteracy. Uh, the White Revolution, uh, initiated in 1963 to modernize Iran's economy and society. And it does work. By 1972, the percentage of owner-occupied farmland had risen to 78%. Okay? So essentially, the, the land-owning classes, uh, the small classes, were being swept aside. Okay? Per capita income rose from the equivalent of about 175 US dollars in 1960 to about 2,500 US dollars equivalent by 1978. So, lots of transitions occurring. Uh, the Shah is using the oil money not just to acquire every and any weapon he can uh, that Washington would sell him. The red line was nuclear weapons. Uh, and there's a, a, quite a bit of a diplomatic correspondence we have from you know, the Kissinger, uh, uh, Nixon Kissinger era that uh, goes into detail that, yeah, he could buy anything he wanted except nukes. However, the US did sell nuclear technology to Iran. It was called Atoms for Peace. Uh, the Tehran nuclear reactor was set up uh, by the United States. And that would, that would, that would be the beginning of, of but remember, technology is dual use, okay, in most cases. Uh, and uh, uh, more recently, in, sort of in the same vicinity of the world, the Obama administration, now the Trump administration, has continued the policy of uh, selling a uh, uh, civilian nuclear technology uh, to uh, the Gulf Emirates. And again, remember, this is all dual use technology ultimately. Now, uh, so the Shah you know, is acquiring all this. He's also sending students abroad to be educated, particularly the United States. Military officers, but also students. This is also the beginning of, these, uh, of the Iranian expatriate community in the United States and Canada. The students, these students being educated in the United States, and one thing to keep in mind is that even in the current Islamic Republic's bureaucracy, most of the technocrats were educated in the United States. Okay. 
many of the political, civilian political leaders were educated in the United States. Bachelors, masters, PhDs. They know us well. Okay. They didn't just take back ideas of technology. They took back ideas of civic engagement. Okay. So you have technological modification and enhancement. You have economic change, legal change. But the one thing that was not occurring, political change. So, but those ideas were spreading. Okay. So resentment begins to build up both about ultimately an autocratic monarchist regime. Uh, so you begin to have, shall we say, the Western educated uh, uh, returnees who are pushing for Western style democracy. You have the clerics uh, who feel that their religious beliefs are getting sidelined, pushing for a return to more <coughs> traditional values. The Shah begins reacting to all this, not by, moderate, by moderately in introducing political change as the United States was urging him to do, but through increased repression. Uh, uh, intelligence services, uh, imprisonment, exile, all the rest. One of the clerics who was uh, forced into exile uh, was an Ayatollah, uh, Rahullah Khomeini. Now, so this, this uh, de the demands for political change are escalating, escalating from the variety the different classes, Western educated classes, traditional merchants, uh, Western educated classes that who are looking for uh, democracy, uh, traditional merchants who feel that their, their products, their livelihoods are getting sidelined by the advent of Western corporations, uh, by the traditional religious classes who feel that their religious values are getting sidelined. And all this is sort of coming to a head. It, it breaks out in January 1978, and it breaks out and as you begin to see this, so here's a little image with the word Shah written, uh, you know, graffiti uh, from the Times. And uh, then, so this is one of the madrasas in Qom. This is the madrasa at which uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini had taught before he was exiled. Uh, his exiles take him to Turkey, to Iraq, particularly southwestern uh, Iraq, where, uh, southeastern Iraq, from where he's able to have sermons smuggled into Iran and then eventually to Paris. And the French, also dabbling in global geopolitics, have been welcoming various Iranian exile groups throughout the decades. They still do. Uh, so, uh, so January 1978, there are protests here in Qom. Uh, the protests uh, spread to all major Iranian cities. Uh, they simmer for months. September 1978, government troops opened fire on demonstrators in Tehran. At this point, the demonstrations include Shia clerics and, and the clerical students, Marxists, merchants, Western educated in, uh, intellectuals, all ultimately pushing to replace uh, the, uh, the monarchy with their model, with their envisioned political model. By November 1978, uh, Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi and his generals using martial law. The Shah kept counting on his Western educated, Western trained troops to put down the revolution. The most elite was, uh, was the Air Force, all trained in the United States. They were the first to defect. Again, all of them had picked up ideas that were antithetical to an absolute monarchy. Okay. No, December 1978, the US government advises the Shah and his family to leave Iran again. They do so on uh, the 16th of January 1979. Promptly, the French put that on a, uh, uh, on a, on a aircraft and sent him back to Tehran. That was a French power play, okay? Now, so you have all these groups competing for power. The ones, the one that wins out are the clerics. And they win out because they have the organization on the ground.
the Shah, in his attempts to consolidate power, had picked up the very easy public targets. The entire spectrum of secular opposition had never been able to consolidate itself, to form links, to have infrastructure, to have mechanisms in place. That's not the case for religious people and religious authorities. Okay? It would be sort of, OK, let us say something happened in the United States, and all democratic organizations were locked up. You couldn't get rid of every church, every synagogue, every mosque, all the rest. Okay? There's an infrastructure there that is often centuries old, okay? well connected. It's in place. So you have a political vacuum into which the clerics have the infrastructure to move right away, while everyone else is looking around and trying to create that infrastructure. And so they can move very quickly into place and turn it to an Islamic revolution. And so you end up with these guys uh, uh, over there, uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini, and then later Khomeini over here. So here, uh, Khomeini returns to Tehran on uh, February 1st, 1979. Uh, 79. Right away, you have an Islamic Revolutionary Council established to run it. <coughs> Theologians are ready, uh, and they have the mechanisms, the system in place. Because that's the one that has served the communities for centuries. Okay? Uh, and, and so they are able, right away, to take control to, uh, uh, to round up the remnants of the Western uh, uh, educated uh, uh, intelligentsia. Uh, uh, execute individuals who have worked with the Shah. This is the beginning of the massive Iranian uh, outflux. Uh, uh, expatriate communities to the United States, an estimate now between 500,000 to a million. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and so again, you know, those who maybe had the ability to try to turn things around were fo either forced out or forced, uh, forced out internally or forced out out of the country itself. Okay. And relations with the United States then further deteriorate with the embassy hostage crisis. 444 uh, days between, late, uh, uh, no, uh, between November 1979 and January uh, uh, 1981. Uh, now, when you look even at the hostage crisis, it, it sort of gives you an indication of you know, how history plays into all this. Uh, or what the Iranian revolutionaries did not realize at that time what we now know from internal White House documents, is that the Carter administration did not intend to launch another counter coup, as had happened in the 50s. Okay? Uh, but the Iranians didn't know this. That the Iranians moved into the embassy at least in, well, partly as an anti-American wave, but also in part because they were afraid that the embassy would be uh, the launching point to bring the Shah back. Uh, and. Uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the embassy staff uh, quickly shredded as many documents as they could. Of course, those are the old shredders. It just shh. so the students pasted them all back together. <laughs> okay, now we have the cross-cutting, pulping, all the rest. Direct legacy technological change because of everything that was pieced together. 444 days. You're holding uh, uh, diplomats hostage, occasionally parading them around, and all the rest. You got a lot of time in your hands. They pasted it all back. Uh, you can access it, it's all on the, on the internet, okay? Now, so, and so the 79 revolution that begins to radically change Iran, okay? So this sort of uh, give you an idea of the, of the structure, okay? You have a new constitution that replaces the monarchy. You end up with a theocratic Islamic republic based on Muslim, uh, particularly the Shia interpretation of Sharia law. So the Shia make about 10% of Muslims uh, worldwide, uh, but tend to focus on um, particularly politically uh, uh, in, in, in Iran for historical reasons, uh, going back to the, uh, uh, both to the origins of Islam and then uh, the Arab conquest. Uh, you end up with having a, the, uh, the uh, sort of a supreme religious authority, uh, uh, the rabbi, the leader. Uh, the leader is elected for life, so think of it as an election of, of a pope, okay? Uh, uh, by an assembly of experts. Khomeini was the first leader, of, uh, uh, leader until his death in 1989. Uh, after that, uh, uh, Khomeini, with, uh, with the glasses, uh, became the second leader. 
The second leader was elected. He's elected and monitored by what's called the Assembly of Experts. The Assembly of Experts comprises of 86 Shia clergymen. They are elected to eight-year terms of office. But you have to be a Shia clergyman to be able to run for office. The Islamic Constitution endorses uni universal suffrage uh, franchise. Uh, uh, initially, the age was 16, uh, raised to 18. Now, in some ways, the Islamic Republic's government structure is not that dissimilar from the United States. They have an executive branch, a legislative branch, a judicial branch. But over sitting above all that is this theocratic branch of government. Uh, so, and, and, and what I've done here is sort of, you know, you can see the electorate here directly making the president and the assembly of experts, legislature. Uh, the, the legislature appoints the guardian council, the, the president appoints the cabinet, uh, cabinet ministers. Yep. So it's this interwoven system. Uh, you know, I often say, you know, if you just lock, were able to take off the theocratic branch, you would have something very, very similar to the United States, including provincial governments, provincial governors, provincial uh, legislatures, all the rest. Okay. So the executive branch, headed by a president who's elected by voters to a four-year term of office. Uh, the president can run for three elected terms, but only two of them can be consecutive. So essentially you have term limits, eight years, no uh, a modern Iranian president has ever come back after, the, after a gap uh, of sitting out one term. The president appoints the, cabinet, uh, the minister of cabinet, uh, the minister of, the, uh, of state uh, with the approval of the legislature and the president also chairs the National Security Council. The legislative branch, branch. that's the modern Iranian parliament building. The Majlis, 290 representatives, uh, each elected to four-year terms of office. The problem with the electoral process, of course, is that while there is a universal franchise, in order to be able to stand for election, whether it is to the National uh, uh, Assembly, to local assemblies, even to uh, local government, uh, you have to be wetted by these clerical institutions. Ultimately, all elections are supervised by what's called the Council of Guardians of the Constitution. Okay. So that's a process that has been resisted to change that in, so ensures the clergymen get to pick and choose. But it is changing. Uh, the most recent change uh, occurred in central Iran at, the, at a city called Yazd, uh, uh, where uh, a, a minority uh, in, in the regular run of election to the city council, a Zoroastrian uh, was elected to the city council. Uh, he, he was not allowed to take his seat on the council uh, by, uh, by the religious authorities. It got appealed all the way up the process, and finally uh, the Guardian Council gave in, and that individual now serves on the Yaz City Council. So uh, there, there are pressures to change. But this, so the theocratic branch, you have this Council of, of Guardians, six clerics appointed by the Supreme Leader, six Muslims, uh, Shia scholars, selected jointly by the judiciary and the parliament. This council determines the constitutionality of all laws and screens all candidates for elected office. And the problem is, of course, that this council, uh, you know, is ultimately comprised of, uh, la you know, of uh, the most influential people on this council uh, are the are ayatollahs. Uh, the uh, the current the long term leader of this council is currently 91 years old, uh, a very hardline ayatollah called Ahmed Janati. Janati, well known for a very public statement a few years ago in which he said that Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians, so the traditional ancient uh, religious communities of Iran, he referred to them as people who sully the earth. So his, his viewpoint is very well set. Uh, but as you see, you know, even they had to back down when you know, the Yazd population, now largely Muslim, even though it still has a substantial Zoroastrian community, uh, you know, took the position that they had elected an individual to serve on the city council. Okay. Now, you have various other uh, committees uh, uh, also headed by clerics. Then you come to the judicial branch, headed by a chief justice, 
then there's uh, uh, there are, uh, there's uh, uh, the equivalent, you know, of associate justices. Uh, but the thing is that, that members of the judiciary are required to be sh Shia Muslim jurists. So there again, you can see how religion, this, uh, uh, you know, if you think about the issue of separation of church and state, and here you can see where uh, the church comes to, shall we say, overlay the state institutions, you begin to see the dangers and, and the dangerous outcomes of what happens. Okay? Uh, and as a result, of course, both individual and civic rights, commercial, civil, criminal codes are essentially based on the Shia interpretation of Islamic law. Now, public enforcement of law and order is overseen by uh, 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 the Revolutionary Guards, the Pastaran, uh, uh, technically re re uh, reporting to the Ministry of the Interior, so uh, technically therefore under the uh, uh, executive branch, but in, in real practice reporting directly to the Supreme Leader. Uh, so, uh, you know, and they're, uh, they're aided by a paramilitary called the Basij. And these are the forces that you end up seeing out on the street attacking protesters. Now, the minority groups. In terms of religious minorities make up less than 2% of the population. So, uh, uh, you know, 90% 90, 90 uh, let us say uh, a Shia Muslim, 8% Sunni Muslim, uh, and then 2% uh, the other minorities. Now, the Iranian, the post-revolutionary constitution further complicated this uh, lack of a distinction between church and state by declaring some groups to be recognized religious minorities, essentially the traditional older religious communities of Iran. So uh, Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians uh, were included in this uh, uh, definition. Here is the uh, new synagogue at Hamadan, northwestern Iran, uh, the rabbi, this is contiguous and right next to the old synagogue, which also has the, the, the perpetrated, because who knows who's really in there, the perpetrated tomb of Esther, a Mordecai from the Bible. Uh, the uh, Armenian cathedral in Isfahan, uh, and a Zoroastrian wedding in Tehran. So uh, these, in, these communities are allowed to elect uh, to have community specific elections at the time of general elections and elect their own representatives to the parliament. Uh, Zoroastrians and Jews uh, get one uh, representative apiece. Uh, the uh, Assyrian or Nestorian Christians uh, get one representative. The Armenian Christians being the largest of the communities gets two representatives. In addition, of course, uh, uh, members of, the, uh, of these minorities uh, 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 you know, uh, do vote in the, for the broader slate of candidates for the parliament. Uh, and as we see, they can even field candidates for uh, other offices, though until recently there's very little success on that, uh, in that realm. Now there are other groups, the Mandeans, for example, particularly in southwestern Iran. The Mande Mandeans, another ancient Middle Eastern faith, the Mandeans trace their roots to John the Baptist. Uh, but despite being therefore one of these traditional Iranian groups, uh, they have never had success getting legal recognition in the Islamic Republic. Uh, the other, and of course, uh, perhaps the largest of the minorities are the Baha'is. Uh, the uh, the Baha'is are not only not regarded as a protected minority, you can see here the destruction to Baha'i holy, holy sites uh, uh, at the time of the Islamic Revolution and shortly thereafter. Uh, the, the Shia Muslim viewpoint is that Baha'i, uh, the, uh, the, the Babi and Baha'i movements originated in, from the Shia viewpoint out of Islam and therefore it is regarded by Muslim clerics as a heresy. So uh, the Baha'i world headquarters is actually in Haifa. Um, so uh, so Baha'is have no official representation, uh, the most persecuted of all the religious minorities, uh, uh, for example, during national censuses, and Iran has had uh, regular censuses, uh, uh, Baha'is, uh, th there is a question about identifying your religion on the census que questionnaire. Baha'is regularly list themselves as Zoroastrians because they don't want to be identified by the census takers and therefore targeted. Okay? Uh, now, the other thing, of course, is that instruction for uh, religious minorities, uh, uh, religious instruction for, uh, let me go back here. 
uh, instruction for religious minorities. See, Iran, like most countries in the world, has a centralized education system, a ministry of education, uh, uh, so fixed uh, K through 12, and then university education, uh, a national examination, all the rest. Uh, you know, the United States doesn't have it. That's why we end up with the SAT and the GRE and such then, uh, 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 and ACTs. Uh, but uh, one, of the, one of the subjects you have to take is religious, uh, is religion. So re the religious instruction, even for Jews, Zoroastrians, and Christians, uh, the, uh, while they can use their own textbooks, the basic textbook is written uh, 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 by the Ministry of Education. And so presents, shall we say, the, uh, the, the state's view of what religion should be and the role the minority should play. Now, this Islamic government oversees a population that's now around about 81 million. Uh, now, in some ways, the Islamic Republic certainly has been successful. It, con it has continued, for example, uh, 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 campaigns against illiteracy, etc., that began under the Shahs. Uh, overall, adult literacy in Iran is around 93%. There's, and the interesting thing is that there's, uh, when you look at individuals under the age of 40, there's no discernible gender difference in literacy. The annually held Tehran Book Fair is one of the largest in the world. This is a public that, that reads widely. Okay. Life expectancy has continued to go up because access to healthcare has improved. Okay, so think about Cuba and, and the healthcare system that what put into place, okay? Uh, so life expectancy for women is approximately 76 years, men 73 years. Infant mortality has fallen to about 1.5%. So in some ways, successful. The other major change that has occurred, particularly after the Islamic Revolution, is ur in constant urbanization. Uh, here's a view of Tehran. You can see the Algos range in the background, smog-ridden. Okay? And in some ways, uh, if, you, if you think of Los Angeles, the mountains in the background, the city, and then out to the ocean. Replace the ocean with the desert, okay? And you get the same conditions of fog and smog. Uh, technology is changing the Islamic Republic as well. Iran, like many third world countries, had very limited landline access in terms of, let's say, communication. So it's a jump to mobile phones that occurred very quickly. Uh, cell phone reception, even in rural parts of Iran, is better than in New York City. Okay. That's to give you a mesh, okay. Now, what of course this does is you end up with internet cafes. So the world comes in, the government tries to shut the world out. Uh, what the Islamic Republic attempted to do, you know, both to control uh, politics in general, to control uh, religious ideas to control even the minority communities' access to uh, co-religionists around the world. When Iran uh, connect, uh, built its own national internet, the Chinese took a different position. The way the Chinese did it is they decentralized it. So you can turn off various areas and hubs. The Iranians have piped it all into uh, a central location. The problem is when you have a central kill switch, it's on, off, yes. So you can tell in, uh, when there's pretty activity, etc. they can slow down the internet. The problem with doing that, it slows it down everywhere, which means if you are part of a local government office or even in the majlis, you pack up for the day and go home because every, all the communication is electronic and the reality is, well, you're getting no work done. So, heck, you know, till they decide to uh, uh, essentially uh, turn the internet back on, we'll do that, okay? You have constant flow of, of uh, you know, whether it's Twitter, tra Telegraph, all these IT-based communications going back and forth. So it becomes a cat and mouse game with the authorities as well. So in that way, Iran's changing, okay? Uh, constant attempts by the state to control and yet with every step the state takes towards controlling, you have some new technology develop. 
so, you know, the satellite dishes we stick up here. Uh, that's an obvious sign to, to the local authorities come uh, pull it down and take it away because you have access to the world. So you don't put up a metal satellite dish. You have little plastic ones you can stick on the window. <laughs> okay, so it's that kind of, so you mean to see how technology also changes, okay? Now, the other thing is that, so you have that. Now the other issue is that, of course, oil is a constant factor, oil and natural gas, okay? So about 40% of the crude oil that enters the global economy on any day flows through the uh, Straits of Hormuz. So essentially, Iran sits pretty much on top of the world's, one of the world's major economic pathways. And that's why we are in, in the Persian Gulf. Okay? That's why CENTCOM's uh, uh, forward projection base is in Qatar. Uh, that's why we have the uh, aircraft carrier fleet in the Persian Gulf. We have it not because we need any oil. The United States gets not negligible oil from the Middle East. Uh, that oil flows largely to India, China, and the rest of the world. But as China does well, as India does well, if those places do well, the money generated flows back to the United States, okay? It's the, remember that image of the US president in Tehran? The US dollar still underwrites about 90 to 95% of the world's economic transactions. More than 90% of all communications, even local calls made in other countries, flow through US communications. So does most, uh, most trading orders. That is why the US can play sanctions. That's why sometimes we overdo sanctions, okay? Uh, so if you wanna know why the United States is what it is right now in terms of the, of the remaining superpower, it's because of the post-World War II order. Uh, the global order is one from which the United States has benefited very greatly. And uh, you think about it. Yes, we issue debt. But they're sending us real money. We're giving them paper, okay? I mean, so uh, we, we, the, 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 this, so what, you know, when we think about okay, the millions of dollars it may cost on a daily basis to have U.S. troops in the Persian Gulf. Well, that that's uh, making sure that we are in charge of everything, okay? Politically, uh, economically, and. Uh, and it also helps us determine which countries can succeed and fail. Sometimes we attempt to have countries uh, uh, succeed and they fail nonetheless. Now, Iran has this oil, yes, there have been sanctions, but Iran's economy is, has been faltering. So I'll give you an idea, in 2012, uh, GDP uh, in Iran was the equivalent of about 600 billion US dollars. 2012. It rose to about 385 billion in 2015, jumped to 240, uh, uh, jumped to 440 billion. So the sanctions come into place, it drops. Then it goes back up again with the Obama uh, 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 sanctions relief. It's dropping again. The IMF estimates are that Iran's economy will be down to about 350 billion uh, in 2018. However, Sanctions are really not the major reasons why Iran is in economic problems. A large part of Iran's economic problems has arisen from a failure to diversify. Uh, its economy still relies very heavily on crude petroleum and natural gas, about 80% of exports. It's followed by uh, essentially uh, rare earth elements, um, ores, minerals for about 10%. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, Iran, with its growing population, Iran has not kept up with food production. And so Iran is an ultimately a net importer, despite even the periods where it's free to export its oil. Uh, and, and that's, of course, not unique to Iran. Saudi Arabia is another prime example of a country that has failed to diversify and Looking at events there right now, it's very unlikely that 2030, uh, the economic plan there will go anywhere. 
Uh, the Saudis now are arresting local economists who just who publicly say this is not going to work. So uh, uh, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, you should remember Iran has had its Islamic revolution. Uh, the current regime in Saudi Arabia is repeating the very same mistakes that the Shah made. They are you know, Western trained uh, students uh, uh, with vast, uh, uh, with increasing social changes and economic changes, but political change is not keeping up. Okay? Now, back to Iran. So, the current uh, uh, Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, a disciple of the first Supreme Leader, Khamenei had served as Deputy Minister of Defense, an overseer of the Revolutionary Guard served as two presidents of Iran, uh, two terms as Iran's president. And then, uh, oh, thank you, when uh, Khomeini uh, da died, uh, uh, essentially the election, think of the election of a supreme leader as a, uh, equal to the election of a pope. Essentially the ayatollahs gather, debate, discuss among themselves. Quite often the leading candidates don't succeed. And so as the ballots go to subsequent rounds, compromised candidates emerge. The current Supreme Leader is one of those compromised candidates. In fact, he was not technically a Grand Ayatollah at the point he was elected. They very quickly had to fudge that and elevate him as well uh, in clerical status. Now, with Khamenei's support, with, with his support, this guy ended up being Iran's president for two terms, Mahmoud Amin Najad. Now, again, Amin Najad is not a, was not a cleric, okay? He uh, uh, had a PhD in engineering from the University of Tehran, served as the mayor of Tehran, uh, elected as the sixth president of Iran in 2005, but then, of course, squandered everything by essentially threatening the United States and Israel and espousing anti-Semitism and all the rest. He served out his first term. June 2009, he was up for re-election. And there appeared to be a moment there where things could really shift. The 2009 presidential election campaign was the most transparent in Iran's entire history, including public presidential debates among the candidates. But at the last minute, the Ayatollahs panicked. And uh, they saw bringing Ahmed Najad back to power as most favorable for the status quo. So the election was rigged. A voter turned out, uh, even by Iran's own interior ministry, this is sort of give you an idea of the tension that election caused even within the government. Even the interior ministry reported uh, that local turnout often exceeded 100%. So the local, the joke was that the Ayatollahs even resurrected the dead to come vote for them, you know, uh, kind of stuff. Uh, but, what, uh, but the protest that followed raised another issue, and that is, why is it that after ending an auto, the autocratic rule of the Shahs, why is it that Iran now has a supreme leader? So that question got even more important, okay? There you go, pretty glum group, group. okay? Uh, so, uh, so essentially, you know, the other thing to remember is that in the years since the Islamic Revolution, Iran's population has reproduced several generations over. Half the population is under the age of 40, was not associated with the revolution, <coughs> has no memory of the revolution. All they have are memories of a life been told what to do by people who they see very little connection with, okay? Uh, diversion of, nat nat uh, of uh, national resources to weapons programs, uh, uh, Iran support of, place of Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, subsidies for the revolutionary guards occurring at points where, you know, Iran's unemployment unofficially is between 12.5 and 15 percent, probably double it for the actual terms of employment, underemployment, particularly among uh, the youth. Uh, inflation running 28 to 30 percent, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, is creating this backlash that we have seen occurring periodically, even now ongoing sporadic protests in Iran uh, across different economic groups. 
The other thing, of course, is that when Khomeini created this theocratic state, he and the clerics around him ran against the grain of Shia theologians as well. The continuous tussle in Shia political thought is between those who are activist and those who are quietest. The quietest group are the larger in number. Uh, they certainly they believe that they need to offer advice to politicians, not be the politicians. However, the benefits of being in power economically, socially, can be very seductive. And therefore, the quietest groups becomes even quieter. Okay? So all this, so think of all this stuff coming uh, to a head in the June 2009 elections. The protesters spanning the spectrum again, like against the Shah. But it ultimately fails because the leaders of the Green Movement at that time, who were protesting the, uh, the re-election of Ahmed they had been former members of the incumbent regime. So in a sense, they themselves ultimately did not have any kind of deep support groups among the protesters. Okay. And then, of course, the government could use the, uh, uh, the paramilitary to quash, violently quash uh, the populist uprising. So essentially, popular dissent goes back underground, runs deep, uh, but uh, is unable to change the existing political structure. Now, you have the 79 elec uh, uh, 2009 elections. Ahmed Najad is back in power for his second term. But he knows that's going to be his last term. He's unlikely to be re-elected again. He turns against those who brought him back to power. He spends he and, and uh, his circle spend the next four years uh, mocking the clerics. Uh, very public comments like, you know, politics is a horse race, and uh, mullahs are not good jockeys. That kind of stuff. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and, and, talk, and, and he starts uh, talking about Iranian nationalism and all the rest. They, they arrange for what's called the Cyrus Cylinder, a, a, a clay uh, cylinder which has an inscription on it, partly by Babylonian clerics. The second part is by is Cyrus himself speaking. Uh, uh, the, the object was uh, always in most Iraqi uh, Babylonian origin ended up in the British Museum. There was a uh, negotiation with Iran that brought it back to Tehran briefly uh, during Amin Amin Najad's second term. And uh, it was interesting to sort of see all these secular elected politicians uh, spending more time venerating a clay tablet and turning back to Iranian nationalism, uh, much to the chagrin of the clergy. And the other interesting thing is Iran did not hang on to the tablet. They returned it to the British Museum. Okay. Now, while of course all this was going on, Iran, uh, the Shah had pursued a nuclear program. The United States has been, had been long fearful that he would uh, attempt to acquire nuclear weapons technology. They held the line with the last Shah. Then the Islamic Revolution occurred, and initially the Ayatollah Khomeini took the position that nuclear weapons were illegal under Islamic law. That changed with the Iran-Iraq border war. The Iran-Iraq border war, Saddam Hussein initiated it, uh, ultimately resulted in Saddam Hussein using chemical weapons against Iran. Uh, the, uh, the precursor chemicals, of course, were supplied by the West particularly the United States. Iran took the chemical attacks to the UN Security Council, the US vetoed it. So again, to sort of set the stage, the, the, pri uh, the president of Iran at that time and the commanders at the front eventually convinced uh, Khomeini to reverse course and recommence the nuclear program. So in, in understanding why Iran recommenced, you should also understand the background as to what led to that. So an, uh, an individual you, some of you have heard of in the news, uh, the sort of high general of Iran, Qasem Soleimani. Soleimani was an officer during the Iran-Iraq war on the front. He knew what chemical weapons attacks were like. He and those around him 
uh, we, we now have the intercepted communications, essentially vowed that they would make sure that never happened again. And so you can see sort of the background that sets the stage for Iran now wanting nuclear technology. So they begin to pursue this. Uh, they are assisted by someone called A.Q. Khan from Pakistan, who essentially sells out the Pakistan nuclear program. Uh, then they work with the North Koreans. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians uh, help them occasionally as well. Maybe some involvement from the French. Uh, 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 so the suspicion began to rise with the uh, US, eventually Europe, the EU, Israel certainly, and also with the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, that, and the uh, IAEA reports to the UN Security Council, uh, that Iran was pursuing not just its civilian nuclear program, but a nuclear weapons program. Now, this, of course, the, the political change, the hostage crisis, all led, and then the nuclear uh, issues led to these economic sanctions that began to steadily cripple, uh, or shall we say, add to the problems of Iran's economy. But, what we, but the problem with these sanctions is that the United States very often takes very broad, a very broad approach to sanctions. Broad approaches to sanctions tend to be almost counterproductive because they very rarely uh, impact the elites who make the decisions. Uh, and, and so it did not ultimately stop Iran's uh, nuclear program. It didn't stop uh, the terrorism, even though the country uh, uh, supported terrorist movements, even though the country became in increasingly diplomatically isolated. Uh, by the time Iran agreed to the JCPOA agreement with uh, Obama uh, and Kerry, uh, Iran could, could halt its nuclear weapons program. You see, the need to have an actual test detonation is irrelevant now. You can model the detonations and know that they will occur and work in real life. In other words, you reach what's called breakout threshold. And breakout threshold is not just unique to uh, the known nuclear powers, Canada has breakout technology, Australia does, uh, you know, uh, Japan does, uh, uh, South Korea does, I mean, North Korea of course has. Uh, so this, this is not, uh, 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 you know, so there are many countries that, uh, uh, Germany does, uh, you know, that where it is, it would take maybe a month to six months to assemble a weapon. Uh, so the Rouhani administration could stop and agree to a deal because as Rouhani told the U United Nations General Assembly right after the deal, he said, nuclear technology has been domesticated. Essentially, it's like learning to drive a car or ride a bicycle. Yeah, you may return to it many years ago, it take you uh, many years later, it may take you a little while to get used to it again, but you know how to do it. Okay. And so what you end up having is an agreement that places a certain number of years restriction on development of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and Iran could agree to that because A, it needed to resume contact with the West, needed uh, enhanced uh, 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 foreign currency revenues to sustain its economy, etc. But also because it, it needed to now move on to other developments including uh, 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 delivery technology. You know, it's, yeah, you can have a nuclear warhead, but what the heck are you gonna do with it? Okay, you need to be able to transmit it. So ballistic missile technology is the next step. And one of the ways in which uh, defense, uh, these international defense uh, treaties work is that they're never comprehensive. I mean, and that's something we should know from our dealings with the Soviet Union and the Russians, is that you have incremental agreements, specific weapons being controlled, etc. Uh, so ballistic missiles were never part of the JCPOA, uh, never covered by them, uh, and uh, and so that became that. Plus, uh, the the, mon the the issue of monitoring uh, the the monitoring regime is what led the, the Trump administration to end sanctions and and uh, pull out of the, of the deal. The Trump administration's position is a tough negotiating tactic. Uh, one intended to push Iran into supplementing rather than abrogating the deal. Uh, but of course, uh, it's a gamble. It's a tough gamble. Uh, the question is whether 
reimposing sanctions will actually halt a regime that did not halt for many years under sanctions. So in a sense, if Washington's position is not handled deftly, you could end up Iran actually moving beyond breakout, uh, the breakout threshold. The other issue, of course, has to do with the other parties. This is not a bilateral agreement. It's a UN agreement uh, between uh, uh, the members of the Security Council, uh, the EU, Germany, uh, and Iran. Uh, so essentially a multinational treaty. Uh, and, and so uh, even recently, the EU has been looking at mechanisms uh, to work beyond the threat of US sanctions and continue engaging with Iran. Uh, economically. So, and the other thing is Iran's eco own economic development plans require continued access to Western technology and substantial trade increases. And certainly, you know, uh, as you have uh, ebbs and flows uh, uh, globally about uh, issues of uh, 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 oil reserve stability, Iran's reserves are important. The Saudis may not like to see the Iranians return to the oil market. Uh, but what's interesting to keep in mind is that despite all the verbal stuff that goes back and forth, Iran continues to adhere by and large to the uh, agreement, even without Washington's presence in it. Uh, what we know from these kind of uh, 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 nuclear deals, whether it's with the Soviet Union, Russia, etc., there is cheating on the margins, about 10% cheating on the margins, that's known, uh, and you have to end up taking corrective measures. And Iran is, uh, whenever it's been pointed out, they say, oh, oh yeah, yeah, we, we made a mistake. Yeah, maybe they didn't make it, they didn't make a mistake, but they, you know, pull back. Uh, they've also, Iran has always remained within the nuclear non-proliferation treaty. It never left it, okay? Even though it has for decades shared technology Ill illegally with North Korea. And even the current US Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, when he, during his confirmation hearings uh, in April, he said that Iran is unlikely to suddenly race towards a nuclear weapon. Uh, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard uh, has pointed out that the clerics have set a range on missile, a missile range. Uh, the missile range is limited to 2,000 kilometers. So certainly, uh, you know, you can, uh, they can, if fully developed, they would be able to threaten the Middle East, but, they, but uh, it's nowhere close to, you know, getting a major Western capital, uh, or uh, uh, certainly not uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, so uh, the issue comes down to, you know, can you fix the flaws in the nuclear agreement? Can you come up with additional agreements or come up with some kind of overall agreement? Uh, but that's the international sphere, uh, technology, verification, etc. How much these kind of agreements can influence regional, broader regional power plays? Uh, particular, particularly with a country that sees a history going back to the 6th century BCE and has at many times been one of the global superpowers or a very important regional power. That's harder to influence, particularly in the fluid dy dynamics of the Middle East. So, uh, uh, so that's not something that treaties are able to control. In addition, of course, treaties uh, uh, can't uh, compel internal change. And in terms, and so let me end with this whole issue of whether it's religious minorities, uh, whether it is, uh, 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 you know, the, the Shia majority. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that contemporary Iranians, sort of, as they look around to their neighbors, and they think about political change, they also think about the consequences of change. The 79 revolution didn't make things very different. They look around now and they see Afghanistan in chaos. They see Iraq come back and forth. They see attempts for regime change in Syria lead to an enormously bloody war in which Assad now has the upper hand. And if you think things have been bad so far, 
wait till he steadily, steadily eliminates every single a member opposed to him in that country. They look at what happened in uh, Egypt with the Arab Spring. In other words, sometimes what you have may not be especially good, but it may provide a little more stability than what the unknown is. And so that's, that's a major factor as well. And you know, they have to look, all they have to do is look down to the south and what's happening in Saudi Arabia now with a new king, but a very elderly king, and a young son with very little administrative experience. And essentially the dismantling of what had been, at least for several decades, a fairly internally stable system. Uh, and the other thing is that the Iranian revolution, despite all the fears in the 1980s, never exported. It never triggered other similar revolutions. Okay? Uh, uh, when Islamic fundamentalism spread, ultimately it didn't spread, spread from Iran. You know, nine, none of the 9-11 hijackers came from there. Okay? They came from Saudi Arabia and the Yemen. Okay? Uh, I, I, as far as I know, there's not a single uh, Iranian uh, held uh, in Guantanamo at any point. So, uh, so, from the, so you have the U.S. perspective, you also have the Iranian perspective. Uh, and, uh, and, and let's keep in mind that uh, the United States and Iran had, despite the ups and downs, at least strategically a stable relationship until 1979. Uh, the rise of Saudi Arabia, despite the early agreement, the rise of Saudi Arabia to be uh, uh, the U.S.'s ally in the Persian Gulf is post-Islamic revolution. And I would suggest that if the Ayatollahs were gone, the U.S. would switch back to Iran right away. So thank you very much.